Hey, this is Dominic, and this is your home for the cutting edge conversations on optimizing your personal performance, lighting up your sex life, and living a purpose driven life of your own design. These are the topics that Dominic and I have both struggled with in our own lives and still don't always get right. This is Brian. Welcome to the Great Man Podcast. Welcome to the Great Man Within Podcast. Every episode is designed to help you discover and live the great man within you. Now, one of the central questions to most every man's life is, what is my purpose? How do I live it so that I can live out my fullest potential? The work that Brian and I do in the Great Man Mastermind is helping the 21 other men in the mastermind discover and live the great man within them through finding their purpose and living it on a daily basis. And what I've seen in working with men over the past five years is that many men hold misconceptions about what purpose is, how to find it, and where it exists in their ecosystem, in their environment, that actually prevent them from ever connecting with that sense of purpose that they so desperately seek. And they end up living a life of frustration, always getting close, taking on lots of work, inundating themselves with responsibilities, accomplishing all sorts of things, achieving accolades, and yet never feeling that sense of fulfillment or alignment with a deeper calling. And that can be really confusing. So in today's episode, Brian and I dive into the three major misconceptions that I found that men have about finding purpose. These misconceptions I draw from my new book, On Purpose Leadership, which is now available for pre-order on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and anywhere else that you buy your books online. And if you buy a copy of that book, I encourage you to send me the receipt to dominic at dominicq.com. And I'll remind you at this at the end of the episode because I'll be releasing some free bonuses that go along with the book itself, worksheets, guided meditations that help you put the book's teachings into practice. So in today's episode, we're going to be debunking the three misconceptions that men have about purpose. We're going to talk about what a man who's living off purpose looks, feels, and sounds like, and what a man living on purpose looks and feels and sounds like so that you can find your purpose and live the great man within you. All right, buddy. This is a big week for you. Business number numero dos has been launched into the world. Vahila. Tell us about it, man. This week has been a huge week. And I think even just the process getting to this week has been, oh, it's been exciting, man. It's been exciting. And I think back to one of the very first podcasts that we did right in the very beginning of this coronavirus pandemic. And we talked about building a foundation. Mm-hmm. And I knew like a lot of the work that we do, a lot of the topics that we cover on this podcast, that was important. And we've been working through like what are the tools to build the foundation? I can't say I knew exactly what I was building the foundation for. Right. Right. Because like this business wasn't even an idea at that point in time. Back in March, when we were doing this episode that you were talking about and the world was changing, we were finally coming to the grips of the gravity of the pandemic you were also at somewhat of a low point too, in terms of your purpose, your direction, where you were going to go. And just a few months later here, you're launching a big business in response to the pandemic. So maybe just at a high level, kind of walk us through the contrast of where you were and then what happened this week, because it happened fast. When we recorded that podcast, I was at a low point, but I didn't know it yet. Hmm. And it was only through conversations with my partner with you, with a few others that I came to the realization that I had fear around starting something, really starting something new again, because I'd felt in a lot of aspects of my life that I had started a lot and I had failed a lot. And that was scary. Yeah. And that's true of business. That's true of elections. That's true of sports and, and aspirations that I've had there. And when I came to that realization, I came to you and said, I think I'm being, I haven't been ready to move forward yet. And so I hadn't realized I was at that low point. So coming to that realization, that was a low point for me (laughs) to have that feeling of failure hanging over my head, that feeling of fear, not wanting to move forward or not even knowing where to move forward. 
Yeah. I remember the time you starting to identify with this concept of being a failure versus these things failed. There's a very big difference, right? Like taking on the identity of, oh, I'm just a failure because maybe my last business didn't do as successfully as I wanted it to. Or I ran for student body president when I was in college and I came in second place. I wanted to be in the FBI and then I missed out on that. And I wanted to pitch at collegiate, maybe professional levels, and that didn't happen. Like like these things that you are close to, then you started collecting this evidence in your life about, well, maybe I am. Like maybe this is who I am. And I remember we had a real heart to heart around that. It was just like, no, 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 you are not a failure. Let me give you all of the evidence and ways that you have succeeded in your life in the ways that you've added value to my life and the ways that the men in the mastermind love you and are inspired by you. And like releasing that attachment to this identity you were starting to wear like a suit around you. I remember watching you bounce off your bottom, like bounce off the bottom in that. And it took a little while for like the pieces to come together, but it was beautiful being able to witness you gaining momentum over the course of these last few months. And then how quickly you've built this business Vahila and maybe just give like our listeners some context for what the business is because it never would have existed if it weren't for the pandemic. Well, it never would have existed if it wasn't for the pandemic and the people in my life that helped me see this. So it was you, it was the mastermind, it was other friends. Prior to starting my first company, Beam was a sexual health company. We did testing, we did reporting, we did what was essentially contact tracing. But prior to that, I spent 13 years at Accenture. 10 of those years were spent in the HR strategy space talent strategy, they called it. The other part of my time there was in digital strategy. So those are the two things that I did while at Accenture. So this pandemic hit and I had a lot of friends from my previous career in the HR space reach out to me and say, hey, Brian, I've been following you on social media. I know that you did this. You had this company that did sexual health and contact tracing. I wonder if you could do the same thing for our employees for coronavirus. Right. I said, interesting. My early adopters of the sexual health app were sex parties because they wanted to like, get everybody tested and make sure there was transparency. That's right. And so I went from servicing sex parties to <laughs> servicing the C-suite in a blink of an eye. <laughs> it was a very weird dynamic. No, it's, but it's anyway, the natural next evolution. Really. Obviously, that's where you would go next, right? <laughs> So it was so fascinating that I hadn't even put two and two together yet until friends had reached out to me. And this was, I mean, Dom, this was a few days after we had that talk about the identity of failure. And so what I found is that the tools that I've developed over these last couple of years, working with you, working with some of the guys in the mastermind, has equipped me to take on this challenge in completely different ways. And to give you some really practical feelings. When I was in that space, that bottom space, I was often tired. Yep. I would be busy like doing stuff and trying to formulate. My whiteboard was always really packed with notes and ideas, but I was really, I felt myself searching and trying to find like, what's my next thing? Like, where do I go next? Naps midday would be often, you know, I wasn't super excited about what I was doing, but I felt like I was ready to birth something, right? So there was a, there was a very a, a big difference. The tools that have equipped me for doing this and what we've put together is a platform that connects coronavirus testing and results to uh, symptom and risk tracking okay. and contact tracing. What's contact tracing mean? Contact tracing is if somebody tests positive for coronavirus. Okay. We have to know who they've been in contact with. Got it. So that we can get them tested and get them in isolation so they don't continue to spread. And that's really the main way that we call this pandemic. We bring this pandemic down to reasonable levels is through contact tracing. So it's those three elements of testing, tracking, and tracing that all that data coming in is into a single platform so that employees know, should I go into the office today or should I not go into the office today? And employers know who's safe to come in and who should be staying home. Right. So four months ago, this was not even on your radar whatsoever. You were just wrapping up, winding down your other business. You were hitting this bottom place. And now, just a few months later, you've birthed something this week. You already have clients who are testing for, you know, who are doing beta tests. And your energy level, like I've, I've had a chance to see you obviously like go through the iterations of this, whether it's our, through our weekly podcast or through the men's group and then obviously through our own friendship connection. 
And it just seems like there's been this, it's kind of like this, like this new light shining from you as a result of that. So I'm curious to know, like what caused all this momentum, like that shift of napping during the day and feeling lethargic to feeling like this. I'm just excited about the process. I think before when I started Beam, I had this grand vision of changing the world when it came to sexual health. I was like, I'm going to change everything. And let me tell you why this is the next big thing and you should invest with us and everything else. And I've had people come to ask me the question, well, what happens when coronavirus goes away, Brian? Like, we don't know. None of us know right now as we're recording this podcast what coronavirus is going to do. And I don't know what this company is going to be after coronavirus. And it doesn't matter to me right now because this process of talking to clients, understanding the market, understanding the tools, understanding the epidemiology, bringing all of these pieces together excites me. Yep. Figuring out what a product should look like to provide value. I didn't know that's something I enjoyed. Yep. But when I started doing it again for the second time, I'm like, oh, this is the part. This is the part that I really enjoy putting together. Yes. The details of figuring out how do you schedule something and tell if somebody's late compared to what kind of test and the protocols they should be in, like that kind of stuff excites me. Maybe it's strange. I don't really know, but I think that's the biggest difference, man. And with that excitement comes a lot of feelings of overwhelm and a lot to do as we're putting all these pieces together. We got a very small team and we're trying to serve as a whole bunch of people and sometimes things don't go right. In my first company, that overwhelm would make me feel stuck. I would try to do more. I would just add more hours to the time that I was working and I wouldn't sleep. All right, the tools tell me this time that our great man, he doesn't get overwhelmed, but things still need to get done. So what am I going to do? Who am I going to pull in? How do I simplify? If I'm nervous before a big meeting, I'll go and meditate for five minutes. I'll do yep. some breath work that we do. These are all new tools that I've honed over a period of time. I've built that foundation. Again, didn't know why I was building that foundation. But for right now, that's what this feels like, man. It feels like it's it's a lot and it's exciting. And I'm excited about today. I'm excited about what it could be. Certainly, I'm very excited about the vision of the product and what it can be today and tomorrow. That's exciting. But I'm enjoying the day-to-day. -day, and that's the big, big difference. That's the biggest difference. And that's a great lead into the conversation we're going to have today about the three misconceptions that men have about purpose. And without giving away what they are right now, like one of the things that you hit right on the money is, is what you're feeling on the day to day, right? That excitement. Of course, there's going to be a mix of other emotions as well. Maybe some overwhelm, maybe some confusion, maybe whatever. That feeling of excitement in the here and now is what allows you to know that you're on purpose, right? So in the book that, that I'm releasing in September and it's available now, you can buy it online on like Amazon, on Barnes and Noble. It's called On Purpose Leadership. And I talk about these two concepts of being on purpose and being off purpose, right? Being off purpose, some of the key characteristics that you mentioned feeling four months ago, lethargic, doing, but not feeling so much, right? Like doing a lot, but feeling either disconnected from it, maybe frenzied by it or overwhelmed by it. These are key characteristics of off purpose. When you're on purpose, there's an energizing effect and it's here in now. It's not in some distant, far off future, like you're feeling it now. These are all indicators that you are living on purpose. And when you're talking about men who are trying to find purpose in, their, in our lives, all of us are to some extent. That's why the mastermind exists. Like all of the guys in the group are there to live this life of full potential, live this life of fulfillment and meaning. And oftentimes we can do so much, take on so many responsibilities at work, at home, in our communities, leadership positions, because we are desperately seeking that thing that's going to give us that feeling that allows us to know or, or believe that like we are on track. And ironically, oftentimes all of the things that we sign up for take us further and further away from that feeling that we are desperately seeking. And I see you smiling as I'm saying that. Yeah, because in that model, it's all about the outcome. And how you get there doesn't matter. And that's the fallacy. The fallacy is everything matters with the process and, and how we get there. I remember for my first company, I tried to take on everything myself because I had to create it. It wanted to be my thing. And it was exhausting. In this case, my go-to mantra is, who can I do this with? Who can we bring in to help this? And th it, that's exciting. Yes, you know, so the process of just connecting with people, the process of figuring things out, the process of, of like what excites me day to day is 
the outcome will take care of itself. Okay. That leads us to the first misconception that most men have about purpose. Are we and the there? First, we're, 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 we're already the in there, man. Like wow. you, you we, lubricated we us and let us slide right into it, man. That dovetail, that worked out nicely. <laughs> yeah. Dovetailing is a nicer way of saying it. Uh, <laughs> the first misconception that men have about purpose, as I've seen it, is they believe that purpose comes through the fulfillment of some massive achievement. That purpose comes through the fulfillment of some massive achievement. Now, some examples of that are, I make a million dollars. I launch a seven-figure, eight-figure business. I win an NBA title, right? I eradicate sexually transmitted diseases from the planet, right? Like some like massive fulfillment of an external achievement. We have this belief that when I get that outcome, then I will feel like I'm living my purpose. Dominic, that all feels really good to me. I mean, I like all those outcomes. Who doesn't, right? Those are extraordinary outcomes. But what happens, and I know you can relate to this, dude, is that in the pursuit of those outcomes, you feel a lack of purpose. You feel an absence of, and you believe that only when that million dollars comes, only when that title comes, only when getting elected the student body president comes, only when having a very successful sale in your startup company happens. Only when those things happen, are you able to feel the sense of purpose and nothing along the way. And the reason why that is such a fallacy is if every day you're feeling an absence of, and you are constantly waiting for the outcome, you are training your mind and your emotional being to spend more and more time in lack, in absence of, in waiting for versus finding it in the here and now. And this is what Phil Jackson talks about. I've made this point a few times on this show. Phil Jackson, NBA coach, 11 titles, six with the Bulls, five with the Lakers, who also won two as a player for the Knicks. When he won his very first title as a player with the Knicks, he said that the experience of winning a title was too ephemeral, right? Too temporary for him to go back and give the same amount of blood, sweat, and tears as he did the year before. Because Yes, when they won, when they had the celebration, when they had the float, when they held up the trophy, it felt great. But then you normalize back down. It's just like what lottery winners experience, right? Like life does not make you that much happier. There's a book written by, it's called Stumbling Upon Happiness, and I'm forgetting the guy's name, but he catalogs how crappy we are at anticipating what will make us happy, what will give us a sense of meaning and fulfillment. And he talks all about lottery winners and high achievers who get the thing that they wanted to get. And then that blip of happiness receded back into normalization and a disenfranchisement with how you'd built your life up into that point. And that's a scary way of living. So the misconception number one is that purpose comes through the fulfillment of some massive achievement. And nothing along the way. And feeling like you're missing all along the way, like you're, you have an absence of purpose along the way. Yeah. Yeah. I remember talking to a guy at Accenture who, like a lot of these large consulting companies, becoming a partner is a really big deal. It's like it's like business meets politics to become a partner. And where he had just gotten to that level, he just made partner. He's like, I don't even, I, I'm not totally sure what to do now. Like I was, I've been so focused for the last four years on getting this position. Like I'm having a hard time now that I'm in it. Yes. I've heard the same thing about weddings. I'm not married yet. Yes. But I've heard the same thing. Like it was this lead up to this giant outcome. And then it's like, okay, the load is blown. Now what? Yeah. Yeah. Like you, like you feel like you're going to shift into some, to some sort of like elevated state that then becomes your new baseline after that achievement, after that wedding, after that partnership, whatever it is. And it doesn't work that way because you have just spent the last, let's say five years feeling an absence of purpose. Like you've trained yourself for five consecutive years to feel like you don't have something and then you only get it for a period of time. And then that wedding goes away, that partnership, no longer, you know, it's like now you normalize into that new way of being. And all of a sudden it's like, whoa, I go back to living a state of lack again, because that's the most familiar. And this is why Tantra is important because it <laughs> teaches us to enjoy the whole process, not just the outcome. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there exactly. it is. We brought we have brought all of our podcasts together in one podcast here, <laughs> Leadership and Tantra. It's actually a great example, dude. I mean, if you think about sex, right? Like as men, 
oftentimes like we're racing towards the finish line. It's just about the orgasm. It's just about getting off. And that's why like in some sexual cases, we just pop off too quickly, right? It's like it's over before it starts. When you can learn that it's not necessarily outcome oriented, the orgasm, that ejaculation doesn't necessarily need to happen every single time. And you can extend the sex, the lovemaking session. You can find deeper layers of chemistry, deeper layers of connection, deeper layers of sexual pleasure when you remove that outcome orientation. That's right. That's right. I love having this kind of, I know we've talked about promotions here already once, but I have a lot of conversations about promotions in my, in my HR consulting world. And I love having these conversations with employees because like, what do I need to do to get promoted? Well, here's your performance criteria. Here's the ratings you need to go through. Like, here's all the mechanics. And so, okay, well, how, when can I do that? How, how long is it going to take me? Right. And there's all these answers to how you go about doing it. And then I always ask the question, I'm like, what is it about being promoted that's important to you? Right. Right. And they're like, well, my career is important to me. My trajectory is important to me. Like, great. Like, so when you're promoted, like what's going to happen? I make more money. I make, I make more money. Right. And so it takes a, a inquiry about three deep, almost asking like three whys, like a little kid. Well, why, why, why? And then they start to get to, well, I would have more control over these decisions about the company or about my team or about the product or whatever it may be. Oh, well, then I would be able to go speak on a stage about this topic because only people at that level can do it. I'm like, great. Okay. If you could do all of those things without the promotion, would you be good? No. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> right. So now we know what we're dealing with. See, here's the thing, man. And we talked about this last night on the mastermind call. Every goal we ever set, every promotion we've ever wanted, every achievement we've ever gone after is always in search of a feeling, right? Every time we do that is because we think it's going to give us some sort of feeling. But if we don't have a measuring stick for that feeling, right? If we haven't defined what that feeling is, then you have a bunch of people who are running around trying to get these promotions who have no idea what that promotion is is going to catalyze in, in, inside of them in terms of the feeling they're looking for. And that's why the guy who got the partnership spent four years trying to get there, got there, didn't feel like he thought it would. And now he's left questioning, like, wait a minute, is my whole life built around misconceptions? And I certainly know I built my life that way. Now, before we go on to the second misconception, I think it could be helpful to give some examples of like extreme examples of people who are completely off purpose, like a man who is off purpose, and then to give like an extreme polarity of a man who's like on purpose. And there's a spectrum, right? So Brian, let's talk about off purpose. There's actually two ends of the spectrum of being off purpose too. There's a passive guy, a passively off purpose guy. There's an actively off purpose guy. Let's start with the passively off purpose guy. So like, what is that passively off-purpose guy feeling? Like what are some examples of what he may be feeling or doing in his life? Passively off-purpose reminds me of the main character from Office Space. Yep. Where, where it's a little, it's almost like Office Space meets Groundhog's Day. If you're one of our younger listeners and you haven't seen either of those movies yet, I know it's ancient history. Go take a look so we can understand <laughs> the, the metaphor here. But it's the guy that wakes up, but is very slow to get out of bed not really excited. Everything is rote. Everything is the same kind of process without any kind of excitement. Even the voice is monotone. Not very interesting in, in what's going on in life. But it's that feeling. It's the, eh, I'm doing it. I'm living. I'm living. I'm, I'm here. But not that excited. Right. Like sitting in that like gray, crusty office space where your boss comes by. Did you do the TPS reports? like very little control of your own life. Like there's a drabness, right? Like a grayscale to that life. And I think that that's a great example, right? Like, like Ron Livingston's character in Office Space as being passively off purpose. Okay, no fire. Now here's where I think most of our listeners, most of the guys listening here don't relate to that guy, right? If you're listening to the show, then you're like, chances are you're not that guy. But I think what many of our listeners can relate to is this active poll of being off purpose. Now the active pull of being off purpose is a guy who's anxious, frenetic, running around in a frenzy. Wildly reactive. Yeah, wildly reactive. Reactive is a big one. Yeah. Doing a lot, but feeling little joy in the process. Spinning lots of plates, feeling overwhelmed, 
needing a sense of importance, but then wanting to run away from all the responsibilities because like the, the, you know, heavy is the head that wears the crown kind of thing. And this is where we see panic attacks start to happen. This is where we see ulcers start to happen. This is where insomnia and sleepless nights start to happen. This is where bad habits creep up like sex addiction in my case, overeating, drinking too much, uh, emotional eating, drinking too much, gambling, alcohol. Yeah, you imagine a guy like that is accomplishing a lot. He's probably getting a lot done. He's probably making money, probably crushing things. But then as soon as he crushes something, as soon as he reaches that objective, it's like, well, that didn't feel good. Now I need to go harder. Yes. Let me go get the next one. And Well, that didn't work, so maybe I need something different. Now let me go, like, whatever it is, done, like cheat on my wife or this or that. Like, let me go do that. And that's going to be the thing. That's going to be the thing. And it's, that's where that frantic energy comes from. And Jim Deathmer talks about this in Conscious Leadership, where like fear and anxiety like that is a great motivator, but it comes with a toxic residue. Ooh, I like that. Say that again. The toxic residue part? It, so the fear is a great motivator and it comes with a toxic residue. Fear is a great motivator. It's a great motivator, but it comes with a, with a toxic piece to it where it's not sustainable. Like It can get us to the end goal. But then we're going to look back and say, that was awful. Yeah. Or I don't feel right. And so that's the piece. Like what's really driving us when we're on that polar side of the active scale? That's great, man. And now when I think about men who I meet that are like this, here's how I experience them. There's a tension to them. There's like they're wound tight, right? I feel a an inability to go deep because like things are bouncing off of them because they're constantly like, I can't go deep. I got so many things on my mind. They don't feel very present. There is like a cloud of freneticism around them. I don't feel at ease in their presence, right? There's something rushed about them. Something rushed about them. Yes. And that joy, like you don't feel that. It feels like joy and like true peace is elusive to them. Right? Like you can feel that it's like hard for them to access. Think about this. Let's take it back a few years to the hunter and gatherers. It's almost like if the hunter was only the hunter all the time. Yeah, right. It's cool when you're hunting something. Like that's really important. But if you're just trying to have a conversation or trying to connect, but their frantic energy, their hunting energy is there at all times, that can be off-putting. That can be scary. And, and I imagine not very, very fulfilling for that individual. Exactly right, man. Again, you know, everything goes back to what kind of feelings are you looking for? Like, that's what we're trying. We want certain feelings. We think getting the promotion, getting the million dollars, getting the title or whatever is going to give us that feeling of I'm enough. I feel good. I enjoy every one of my moments. But when we lose sight of why we're doing what we're doing and we're just microscopically focused on that goal, we lose sight of what we're trying to feel, cultivate in the process. And that's why, okay, before we go into the second biggest misconception, I think the opposite end of the spectrum from being off purpose is on purpose, right? Like, so a man who's on purpose, Brian, like when you've met these kinds of guys in your life, or you've witnessed these people, either, you know, like books you've read or watched them on YouTube or seen them on stages, what are some characteristics of a guy who's on purpose? So a guy like that, that's on purpose, this guy could talk about earthworms (laughs) earthworms <laughs> and it would be interesting like right. just i know what you mean knowing that they're yeah. that into that thing that they're on purpose for is exciting to be around it's someone that is fully present you said it's kind of the opposite of the of the frantic one right somebody that's fully present even though you know they have this this thing in the centeredness in them that is so clear Yeah. So like I think about if you were doing the active and passive polls of someone who's on purpose, let's think about a passive poll with Corey Mascara, who's been our guest on the show a couple of times. He's a meditation instructor, very well-respected. And when I think about Corey, like he can just sit somewhere and you can look at him. He's not doing anything, but you can look at him and there's a peace to him. When he walks into a group of people, there's a presence about him where he does nothing. He just stands and he breathes and he listens. There's a looseness to his body, right? There's a, an ease, a coziness that he feels inside of himself. He's not doing anything. He's just there in presence in a very passive way. But you can tell there's something special about how he lives his life. 
right? Corey's a great example of that. Yes. Great example of that. And that's like in the non-doing of things. That's just in the being of things, right? When you talk about an active pole, someone who's on purpose, I mean, there's plenty of examples of this, like any musician who takes the stage, right? Like any a professional athlete that's on the field, Tom Brady at the end of the Super Bowl, last couple of minutes, Michael Jordan on a court. You know, like when, when you and I are in flow here, talking about what we love to talk about, we are in a very active state of being on purpose. And when you talk about the, the guy who's like interested in earthworms, like he's lit up talking about earthworms. He's enthusiastic about the dorkiest subject on the planet, but there's something magnetic about someone who's so lit up, who knows the nuances, who knows how to create magic around, magnetism around him when he's talking about that. Those are active characteristics of someone who's on purpose. And he doesn't need your approval. He is not seeking your approval. He's just lit up from the inside out about something as trivial as earthworms. So somebody that's on purpose can live anywhere on that scale. Sometimes they're more on the passive side. Sometimes we're on the active side. Dom, have you seen, um, you use some examples like Corey, do those guys traverse that scale or do they typically live in, in one area? Totally. Because like there's, there's always a difference between being and doing, right? Being is just, I would say more passive, right? Like mm-hmm. you're not, you're not in action. The doing is the active side of things. And I think where many guys suck is in the being, right? Just, just like in the passive side, like that's why stillness and solitude and slowing things down is something you'll hear every wise person talk about. John Wineland, in one of our most popular interviews, I think it's a top five episode, he said, every man needs to have a stillness practice, whether it's five minutes or 30 minutes a day where you do nothing. You sit and either you meditate, look out at your backyard, whatever, do nothing so that you can slow the game down. I gave a a quote, I think it's from Pablo Picasso in the book, Essentialism, where he says, no great order of work can come without great solitude, just being alone and slowing things down. So men who want to be on purpose have to cultivate a sense of passive on purpose behavior through stillness, through being and less doing. Yeah. I think that that's such an important part, Dom. When you said Michael Jordan as an example, and we just, of course, recently saw the documentary and there's no doubt that that guy has crushed it. And I'm from Chicago, grew up, I mean, Michael Jordan being the hero. And when I saw that documentary, I saw a lot of sadness. Same. And I'm wondering like, where a guy like Michael Jordan, if he has had that opportunity, had those tools to build the foundation, or if he's been on the, just only on the more active side of things. Yeah, I would like that. That's a great insight. I would put Michael Jordan at the extreme end of the active pole. On purpose in many respects and off purpose in many others. And here's what I mean by that. So one of the eloquently simple things about competition, like NBA is, like there's a very clear winner and loser. One of the things that that does is like, you know, there's an NBA championship. Like, you know, there's a trophy at the end of the season that like one team is going to win and one player who's going to be on the team that's the most important, like Michael Jordan was, is going to hoist that trophy up. That gives him a very clear connection to a future point, which is what many of us are looking for, like some sort of clear thing that gives us clarity on a daily basis of what we're working towards. That gives you like a sense of grounding, a rootedness. So that's one of the great things about having sport is there's that championship that gave him on a daily basis a sense of reason to compete. The way that Michael Jordan went about it, though, was from an angry perspective, Like if you hear him talk, like his entire existence was about being better than someone else. It was always from the outside in, never from the inside out. You very rarely heard Michael talk about, and I'm sure he does to some extent, beating himself the day before, like being better than himself in a compassionate way. It was always, who's the guy can I crush? Who is the guy who disrespected me? Who's, you know, the Larry Bird who won two titles in a row and Magic Johnson who won two titles in a row, but never won three in a row. There always had to be someone to beat. And that gave him the motivation to be in great active doing on purpose in many respects. Like the guy brought excellence every single day and you can't take that away from him, never will. But when he left the game, you can see that that's where the sadness kicks in because he doesn't know who he is. Maybe I should back off off that statement because I don't know Michael Jordan personally, but from the outside looking in, it appears 
He's having a difficult time defining who he is in the absence of that competition, in the absence of beating someone else and being the best, because that's how he defined himself was only being the best. And I would imagine that that passive pull of being on purpose is quite elusive to him. Yeah. When we talk about being on purpose, being related to feelings, it's easy to not go there, to not feel that feeling when there's a very clear external trophy. Yes. NBA being a very clear one. Like, I'm just going to do all the things to get to that. Yes. And that's it. So it's interesting on whether that – is that on purpose? Is that not on purpose? It's a lot of doing. It's a lot of accomplishing with that toxic residue. That's right. Well, I think that also then leads into the second misconception, which is that purpose exists in the future. That purpose exists in the future, whether it's like near future or some far off future. We hear this with a lot of the men in the mastermind, a lot of the men that listen to our show. Is that like, oh, but – and this kind of ties in nicely to the, you know, like it comes through this massive external fulfillment, right? Fulfillment of an achievement on the outside is that it's off in the future. And once I get there, then I will feel that sense of purpose. And it's backwards, right? Like what you said before about Vahila in your new business is that like, I feel excitement now, right? Like the business has clients, but it's not like like you're raking in the profits. It's not like it's some massive like like success that people are investing millions of dollars into yet. You're feeling the the excitement now because there's momentum, there's curiosity, there's promise. That's the feeling that you're connecting to. That feeling on a moment by moment, day to day basis is your indicator that you are on purpose. I like to call this the someday aisle. An aisle, I-S-L-E. Like someday, like I'm going to be on this island drinking a mojito. Like it's, I'm going to do everything to get to that someday aisle, someday aisle. As opposed to what you're talking about, Dominic, which is I'm here right now. I'm doing things right now. And there's something. I don't know if it's joy, if it's gratitude, if it's whatever it may be in the moment right now that is lighting me up. That's right. And if it's not lighting me up, that's okay. Let's ask some questions around what this is. How do we further align this sort of activity? I'd be lying to anybody living in a bubble here if I could say that every single activity that I've done as part of building this this very new uh, small business, I don't like doing legal documents. It sucks. I'm not very good at it. But I do know that by having that understanding of what those legal documents are, it's important. And what can I learn from that? So like even the process of those things that I don't like, that don't feel totally in alignment, and I know that eventually that needs to go somewhere else, I can still enjoy that process. I can still enjoy that day, those moments. That's right. And I think what you're talking about here is also a common phenomenon that I think a lot of men experience is that my present day work is the barrier to purpose. Like what I'm doing today is actually the enemy towards the purpose. And I write about this in On Purpose Leadership. Most of us assume that because our purpose is in the future, right? This is the misconception that purpose is in the future, that what I'm doing now is my obstacle, is my enemy to living that purpose. I know I felt that way for a period of time when I was at Prudential, where I worked for 15 years. And there was that, I want to feel freedom. I want to feel in control of my own life. I don't want to have a cap on my income, right? Like all of those kinds of things. I want to create more. I want to choose my clients more, like all of that stuff. And I could easily make the case that my work there was the enemy to me having those feelings. But when I decided that I was going to be building a future, that I was going to own my own business, and I made that decision two years before I actually left, I shifted my focus to the work I was doing. And I was saying, oh, for these next two years, I'm looking at work as being the fulfillment of my purpose. Everything I'm doing now gives me a chance to say, if I don't like this, how do I bring something I enjoy into the moment? How can I think differently? And those last two years at Prudential, they got the fucking best of me, man, because I started thinking differently. I stopped looking at my work as the enemy. And I started looking at my work as the training ground, as a daily way. Yeah, to go from like, oh man, if I wasn't doing this, then I could be doing my purpose. I could be doing my thing. As opposed to like, I'm learning. I'm on the training ground right now. It's happening right now. 
I like to a mantra that I use often when I'm get, when I'm starting to feel myself gravitate towards the outcome based thinking only. Yep. I have a mantra and I call it everything's an experiment. Everything in this moment is an experiment that we're that we're trying out and we're going to see if it works if it doesn't work and that's okay. Like now we have that doesn't mean we don't have deadlines, it doesn't mean we don't have goals. We absolutely do. But everything is an experiment in figuring out what matters and what works. 100%. And that makes it more fun. Yeah, and I think we we lose sight of the fact that we have the authority and the agency to experiment all of the time and experimentation was one of the biggest things I brought into my last two years at Prudential because I knew I wanted to be a creator. I knew I wanted to be a thought leader. I knew I wanted to speak. So I came up with ideas that I brought into my sales team. You know, I would run workshops and web and, and, and series and, and to see like, what did, did my stuff stick? Did they resonate with it? Did I was able to overcome obstacles and they loved it and it helped them open up, right? In different ways. It helped them elevate their performance. It was all well aligned. It was always available to me. I just had to look at it differently. So that misconception of purpose is in the future and the corollary is my present day work is the enemy. If you shift that focus, purpose is in the now and the work you are doing now can tap you into purpose. If you can experiment and look for those openings, then like that the floodgates will open. That's where we just start to hone and get clear on what that purpose is because now we are open to it. We're seeing what aligns to us. Like you said, for example, when you were at Prudential, you're like, I wanted to create more. Well, somehow you figured out that you wanted to create more and you start to say, how do I bring in more of that? That's different, man. Like where I was at not very many months ago was actually in that more passive state of let me just like think, let me just kind of like write things down as opposed to like, let me do and see what starts to feel like alignment to me and be open to what is or what isn't. That's the experiment. Yeah, the doing for you was like, let me get into motion around like what feels good, like what feels, and I'll get feedback. If this doesn't feel good, then I'll do something else. And then like that, then emotion that feels like, ooh, energizing, let me build on that. That's how I get some momentum. This final misconception, this third and final one is you have to know the what and the how of your purpose in order for you to get started, right? So like, let, let's talk about this for an example, like, like I knew I wanted to be my own boss. I knew I wanted to be a creator. I knew I wanted to speak, but I had no idea what that really looked like. I had no idea like what book I would write or what I'd be speaking on or what my business would be called. And if I waited for all of those like stars to align, I would have gotten nowhere. I would have been really frustrated and I wouldn't have been in action at all. I would have just kind of like waited, sat, waited, sat, grinded, consternated. So the why, the, the, the how and the what are often the last things to come, right? Like you often don't know what business, you often don't know what path. And if you allow those things to get in your way, then yeah, purpose will elude you. We like to call this the what how soup. Yeah. The what how soup. That's right. One of the guys that we did a retreat with last year is now one of the leaders in the mastermind. I remember he was in that exact spot just spinning. Like, what am I going to do? How is it going to be? How, how are we going to make money with this? Like, what does this look like? What do I want to really specialize in? And he was paralyzed by the what how and just swimming in the soup. Let's talk about that. So this is Mark Melvin. He's he's like just a, like an absolute extraordinary, like we talk about great men, like he's a great man, right? He's just like, a, an, he's one of the anchors in the mastermind, one of the leaders. And for anybody really quick, I, I want to plug Mark really quick before we get into his story. Yeah. Because this guy has has provided so much value in my life when it comes to a lot of things, but this in particular is around yoga. Totally. I have been my entire life so fearful to like go into a yoga studio, like not be flexible enough, not whatever, but know it's probably good for me and something I should do. And Mark was the first guy to be able to bring some of that practice into my life in a such a digestible way for like guys that are too stiff that don't really do yoga. He was so awesome at that. So if anybody is looking for a yoga guy that can help help you do that, dude, he is the guy to do that. Yeah, just reach out to us through the website, you know, doinnerwork.com and um, we'll put you in touch with him because he's fantastic. I mean, he, Mark is a corporate attorney. He's, he's, he's an attorney, right? For 15 years. And he has a love of yoga, a love of meditation. And he has an ability to actually make that approachable for guys like Brian and I to connect the dots from the mystical to the practical and everything in, in between and spiritual. And about a year ago when he came to one of our retreats, 
he was thinking like, I want to do more. I want to do more of this. This is central to my life. I want to teach more, but like he didn't know how, and he was getting stuck on, but I don't know how, 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 you know, how do I do more of this? How to do more of this? And you could feel his energy dissipating. You could feel the consternation. And when we got away from the how, and just like said, like, can you get more into the practice of things, share things, what feels good for you? Let the, the next step illuminate itself. What ended up happening was through Mark just putting the attention back on what he loved. Then like he became a part of the mastermind. Then he became like our resident meditation and yoga instructor. And then people are hiring him from inside the mastermind to do trainings for their corporate audiences. Like things just continue to add and like there's a snowball coming down a mountain. I think he even had questions when he was in the what house soup. He's like, what kind of certification should I get? What kind of degree do I need? What kind of, what kind of, what kind of? And eventually when he started following the activities that he really enjoyed, what he should do next became clear and he got his certifications and is still going through, I think the master's program right now. And, and so all the, it's been so cool to watch all of those pieces come together. It really has been beautiful. And this is like one of the concepts I talk about in On Purpose Leadership is follow your greatest energy, right? Because like when you don't know the thing that's going to light up the next five years of your life or the next three years of your life, you may not even know the business that you want to build for yourself or the next role you want to take in the company, but you do know the feeling that feels good for you. That's where the greatest energy comes in. So if you can continue to bring a spark into your life, even if it seemingly has nothing to do with that path forward of building the business or making the money or getting the promotion, as long as it provides you a spark and energy, you bring enough of that into your life, it's inevitable that your purpose will illuminate itself in a different, deeper, and more meaningful way. And to get ready for change because that path is one that can't be just mapped out. I did so much project management in my life where I was like, these are the exact dates we're going to hit. Here's the milestones. Here's the deliverables and everything else. And that's great within the the boundaries of that. But to do that for life, it's impossible when living on purpose because it is a wild ride that changes frequently. Exactly right. And I think, you know, to to pick up on something you said near the beginning, with COVID, with the pandemic, we have no idea what the future will look like. We have no idea what the better normal is going to look like, which just gives us much more of a wake-up call to it's now that we need to be paying attention to. It's right now. And as Brian said, like when you start to follow that energy of right now and enjoy more of right now, a lot of the plans, the best laid plans you have for your future are much more flexible. They start to evolve in the best of ways because that's where instead of unpredictability being scary, it's more of an adventure. It's mystery. It's excitement. It's seduction. Like These are things that have been missing from most men's lives. And when you start to live this way, Like there's an energy and a vibration and a magnetism that shows up on a daily basis. All right. Awesome ending. I got got goosebumps. Hey, so the three major misconceptions that most men have about purpose are, number one, that purpose only comes through the fulfillment of some massive achievement. Number two, men feel that purpose only exists in the future. And the corollary to that is that Your life or your work of today is the obstacle or the enemy to getting towards that future state. And then number three, the misconception of you need to know the how and the what of your purpose. The picture has to be completely painted. You need to know everything, every last I dotted, every T crossed before you can live your purpose. These three misconceptions are the very things that prevent men from finding their purpose. Don't let that happen to you. And if you have been inspired by this conversation and are ready to connect to and live your purpose on a daily basis, I wrote the book for that. It's called On Purpose Leadership, How to Master the Art of Leading Yourself So That You Can Inspire and Impact Others. It is available for pre-order now anywhere books are sold online. So order it, send me the receipt to dominic at dominicq.com so that when in the next couple of weeks I release the free bonuses, which are worksheets, exercises that help you to unpack the deeper wisdom of the book and make it real for you, some guided meditations and extra bonuses that I'll be throwing in to help you turn the book from just an intellectual exercise to actually implementing practices that allow you to live a purpose, your purpose on a daily basis. On Purpose Leadership, anywhere books are sold.